ओम ज्ञान से ज्ञानांजनशलाकाया चक्षुर्मेतमेना तस्मै श्री गुरवे नमः सो आई एम शेयरिंग द स्क्रीन नाउ एंड विल स्टार्ट सो दिस इज आवर 7th सेशन और सेक्शन 9 एक्चुअली द 9th सेशन वी आर ऑन द वर्स 340 Three nine will be discussing. We'll be introducing the concept of sacrifice and specifically the sacrifice in the form of yagya. And to trace back, basically what we are doing in this course is we are focusing on uh, the flow of the Gita and selecting verses which help us to understand the Gita's concepts while also taking our understanding further. of the overall concepts that we need for growing in our spiritual life so till now in the second chapter we discussed about various concepts of applying the principle of the knowledge that i am a soul to various walks of our life now we will move to specific practices that can infuse us with spiritual consciousness so this class has three parts what is sac- what is sacrifice is it a ritual and are rituals necessary so each session is designed as a answer to one or more questions and here we are focusing specifically on the forms in forms of activities that can directly spiritualize our consciousness so we are discussing based on 39 in the bhagavad gita yagnyarthat karmano anyatra loko yam karma bandhana तदर्थम कर्म कौंतेय मुक्त संग समाचर सो यज्ञार्थात कर्मणो अन्यत्र कृष्ण टल्स अर्जुन दैट परफॉर्म योर कर्म इन द फॉर्म ऑफ अ यज्ञ वर्क एज सैक्रिफाइस अन्यत्र इफ यू डोंट डू इन दिस वे लोको अयम कर्म बंधन इन दिस वर्ल्ड यू विल एक्सपीरियंस द बॉन्डेज ऑफ वर्क कर्म बंधन तद अर्थम बट इफ यू वर्क इन दैट वे फॉर दैट पर्पज अर्थ कैन मीन मीनिंग अर्थ कैन ऑल्सो मीन पर्पज बट इफ यू वर्क फॉर दैट पर्पज वॉट इज दैट पर्पज यज्ञार्थात इन दर्स्ट लाइन ऑल्सो दर्ड अर्थ वॉज देर सो फॉर द पर्पज ऑफ यज्ञ अगेन फॉर दैट पर्पज अर्थ द इफ यू वर्क इन दैट वे तद अर्थम कर्म कौंते मुक्त संघ समाचर Mukta Sangha Samachar. That you will stay free. You will stay liberated. You will free from bondage. Always some achara. In this way, you can act. And Sangha is association. It's very contaminating worldly association. Mukta is you will stay free from it. So Krishna is also introducing another concept of bondage. Uh, bond is also speci- referring to another concept of bondage and liberation. and this is a major theme in the gita which we will come to in due course but essentially krishna is recommending work as sacrifice so let's look at what is sacrifice first the principle of sacrifice is universal it essentially means to give up some immediate pleasure for some higher purpose in fact the word the english word sacrifice comes from the same root from which we have the word sacred so sacred and sacrifice the same root and there is a verb form which unifies those two words it's called sacralize sacralize is to make sacred and sacraments is a word which often in the christian tradition it is used they use it for referring to religious rituals so sacrifice so in that sense the word sacrifice Uh, means to make sacred the activities that make something sacred are called as sacrifice so the principle underlying sacrifice is that uh, there is something which which we can use which we can enjoy for ourselves but we give it up for something higher now in today's world we may use the word sacrifice in uh, in a general sense say for example in a cricket match if there is one batsman who is a, who is 
a lower order batsman other batsman a top order batsman and one of them have to get run out because they're out of the crease so the lower order batsman may just come out of the crease so that that batsman gets out and the higher order batsman might so that the higher high, high order batsman doesn't get out so we at such time it will say that the lower order batsman sacrifice their own wicket sacrifice means that it's not necessary that you have to give it up but you give it up so that the, the higher order batsman is there then that batsman can bat well and may be able to lead the team to victory so that's the idea that sacrifice so to give up something which we don't necessarily have to give up but we give up voluntarily and we gain some higher purpose or higher uh, higher higher purpose is served by that now yagya specifically is a form of sacrifice wherein we give a uh, which is a specific yagya is a specific form of sacrifice involving the sacrificial fire the sacrificial fire is where offerings are made in the rigveda it is said that devanam paramo vishnu avamo agni tadanta sarva devata that among all the various uh, celestial beings vishnu is the highest devanam paramo vishnu avamo avamo the lowest is agni and in between tadantara sarva devata in between are the various other celestial beings other gods this concept of gods we will discuss later but in this context what does it mean agni is the lowest here lowest is not in terms of position but in terms of accessibility because vishnu is considered to be the supreme being he is transcendental and he is not normally accessible to people but agni or fire is considered to be most accessible because fire becomes the medium through which various things are offered to the higher beings so what could be enjoyed for our pleasure is offered to the divine through the medium of the fire so fire sacrifice becomes a ritual but the principle is to give up something so it could be we might uh, offer some <clears throat> we might put some ghee clarified butter is considered a delicacy expensive nutritious we offer it then similarly other grains could be offered some cloth may be offered the idea is what we could enjoy we give it up for the purpose of sacrifice so yagya the principle of yagya when krishna uses in the bhagavad gita he doesn't use it specifically for fire sacrifices that is one connotation often words have certain standard meanings and they have some general meanings also so for many people the word yagya immediately especially those who are familiar with the broad indian or bhakti culture for them the word yagya invokes the idea of a fire sacrifice so krishna uses it in the sense of a fire sacrifice but he also uses it in the more generic sense so yagya krishna uses broadly in the form of sacrifice and specifically in the form of fire sacrifice so now <clears throat> now we are moving to that first i talk about sacrifice and now i'm going towards the topic of rituals so is fire sacrifice specifically is it a ritual now when we want to do sacrifice there are there are specific ways in which sacrifices can be done and those specific forms are called rituals so in this image we see a sacred fire which is emanating within a altar within a brick and stone arrangement made in a particular way and there is a sacrificial ladle and there are various other objects that might be offered so this is the idea of sacrifice so now the specific forms in which a sacrifice might be done that can be a ritual so now i'll move on the second aspect of the talk what is, what is a ritual so now ritual the word ritual often in our days has a negative connotation that when we whenever use the word ritual we say don't be so ritualistic however the fact is that rituals are there in every walk of life that rituals they animate or every walk of life so if we consider when two people meet each other they shake hands a handshake is a ritual of greeting in some traditions some people 
when they meet they might bow from the waist down so in some traditions people may fold their hands so in some traditions people may rub their noses now these are all uh, all ways of greeting and they are rituals now sometimes some things become so common that we don't even think of them as uh, as anything noteworthy or anything anything unusual so for example the area of handshake has become such a common spread a widespread part of mainstream culture that you don't think much about it we just do it but what is it you know why, why shake hands some people instead of shaking hands might punch their hands that's also one way of greeting why specifically shake hands no that's one way of greeting it's and that essentially when we talk about rituals rituals are basically structured ways in which we express our intentions so for example what do rituals do exactly they provide structure for expressing our emotions and organizing our actions so if there were no ritual of shaking hands for example then what would we do if we wanted to if we wanted to if we met someone and we wanted to greet them how would we greet them we might have a, a feeling of affection of cordiality of whatever in our hearts but how would we express it we need some structure structure for expressing our emotions and for organizing our actions so if there are no universally recognized cultural forms such as rituals then there is no way for us to actually in a in a way express things that are accessible for others so if a person doesn't know what a handshake means and then somebody shakes hands with them they may wonder what do i do with this hand you extended so when both people know what a particular ritual signifies then that ritual becomes a struct easily accessible and easily doable structure by way a structured pattern of action by which certain emotions can be experienced ex ex conveyed rather so now now there the now some rituals serve a purpose now some rituals Uh, they might just be even in secular life by secular i mean non religious life in normal life some rituals might just be based on some superstition or some blind faith consider that when we uh, when uh, during birthday celebrations people blow candles now why specifically blow a candle uh, actually it's just done nobody questions why oh that is the way we celebrate birthdays we light a candle and then we blow off a candle so if we go back to this particular practice it originates in the medieval times in in the scandinavian countries where it was believed that if people uh, that when a person is born especially a child is born sometimes a evil spirit may haunt that person and for as many years that person lives that many spirits may come and haunt and the belief at that time was that if you extinguish a candle that's that will drive out that evil spirit from within the person so now in today's world view people don't believe in evil spirits in fact the idea of evil spirits existing or possessing someone or even more that blowing off a candle will drive off a evil spirit that those beliefs will beliefs would seem ridiculous for most people today and even without knowing those 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 ideas underlying these practices people do it so rituals are there in every walk of life and some rituals might be irrational in their in their content but now today when somebody blows a candle people cheer and celebrate and sing and it's considered a festive occasion so certain emotions get associated with certain actions even if there is no intrinsic or rational basis for them now if you consider a cricket match in a cricket match we might have say the when the batsman hits a shot, a shot that goes over the boundary then it's considered a sixer and here we see uh, uh, the umpire raising the hand raising the arms 
Now, why raise arms? Why not just convey six with one's fingers? Why not just convey four when a boundary has it? No, this has become a convention. And that is what is followed. So now, uh, when somebody, an umpire raises the arms up to convey a sixer, uh, it has become intrinsic, it has become associated with the idea of a, of a big hit. And people cheer wildly. So again, this is a ritual. So I'm using the word ritual in a broad sense to convey that certain externals to uh, uh, to state that certain externals are used for certain symbolic purposes. So symbolic, the symbolic purposes can be associated with something in the outer world, some event that has happened in the outer world, or they may be connected with some in some emotion in our inner world that we want to express. So in this case, the raising the hands conveys an event that has happened in the outer world. But the idea is this association of certain physical gestures, physically executed actions with something which is not intrinsically connected with those actions. That's the, that's the idea of a ritual. So just as, so the rituals themselves are not bad. Rituals are not only uh, not bad, they are actually essential to structure our daily dealings. So now some, just as rituals are there in all walks of life, there are rituals in, uh, in our, in our religious life also. So now what, what all, now what do religious rituals do? They serve many purposes. Broadly, I talked about five purposes over here. The religious rituals make us more receptive for experiencing the divine. I will talk later about religion and spirituality and their difference. Here suffice it to say that religion, it comes from the word religio, which connects us with God, which binds us to God, turns us back to him. So religious rituals refer to uh, those actions which turn us toward God. And now how do rituals make us more receptive? Because often these rituals are founded on a profound understanding of how the human, uh, human mind and body interact. Say for example, I am right now sitting on this chair. Now if I'm sitting on this chair, I just lean back. And then I put my foot on the table. And then I say, I am I'm feeling very humble now. Ah, if I say that, people will start laughing. That's ridiculous. The very idea of leaning back on your, leaning back and then putting your foot on a table, that conveys a certain amount of bossiness. And that's the opposite of humility. So certain gestures in themselves convey humilities or they convey or they even trigger certain emotions within us. So if we sit in a bossy posture that invokes within us the emotion of bossiness. In contrast, if we sit in a, maybe we sit a little bit more with bent forward slightly, that indicates attention. So if we go in front of a sacred image, if we go in the temple and we fold our hands or we bow down, that bowing down, prostrating oneself that is a physical gesture that both conveys as well as uh, as well as activates the emotion of humility and supplication of subordination of prayerfulness so in this way emotions are associated the, the physical gestures are associated with certain internal emotions so when we fold our hands or prostrate ourselves those gestures, those physical actions make us more receptive for experiencing the divine because that physical, that physical, physical set setting, physical situation triggers those emotions. So then this is, so basically rituals are like interaction between the two. So when the divine wants to share divine experiences with us, the rituals make us more receptive. And from our side, what do the rituals do? The rituals express devotion when it is present. So if somebody has a very prayerful heart and they go in front of the 
uh, Lord in the temple and then they fold their hands and they recite some verses and they off prostrate themselves. Then what is happening? They prostrate them. And what is happening? They're expressing the devotion when it is present. Also, rituals can express our desire for devotion when devotion is not yet present. So now, sometimes doing the externals helps us to develop the internals. So the externals, they express, even if sometimes we do not feel prayerful or humble, but if we just fold our hands and pray and recite some verses and glorification of the divine, then that itself can kindle devotion within us. So that's the third purpose. They can express our desire or our intention for devotion, even when it is not present. Now, sometimes it can just, it can just become a formality. If there is no devotion and there is not even a desire for devotion. So devotion, we could say, is the emotion. Oh, the emotion of attraction, the emotion of submission. Uh, the, they all, all this comprise devotion. If that is not present, at least that intention is that I want to feel devotion. But if, if even that is not there, then it just becomes a formality. And quite often, the word ritual, as is used in common parlance, has this sense that don't be ritualistic. That means don't just do something mechanically, perfunctorily, without any investment of emotion in it. So we could say, when the right spirit is there while performing the ritual, then spirit plus ritual becomes spiritual. So spirit and so spirit and ritual becomes spiritual. Now just the spirit alone is not enough. The spirit needs to be expressed in a particular way. And when the spirit is expressed through uh, the right way, through, through the right rituals, then it becomes spiritual. And then after that, uh, also the rituals can be Sometimes they can just be formalities, but that is that might we might say that's just harmless. But sometimes the rituals can also be used to mislead. So they can be used to misappropriate. Just like if we consider handshaking, somebody might shake hands, and handshaking is supposed to indicate cordiality and welc and a welcoming attitude. But that person, while shaking hands, might be thinking, "When can I stab this person behind the back?" Now, sometimes my backstabbing might be just. Uh, character assassination, rumor mongering, or it can even sometimes be physically attacking a person. But the idea is the ritual can be, ritual can become a mask for covering up something which is entirely opposite to the ritual, opposite to what is meant to be conveyed through the ritual. So similarly, some people might use rituals just to Oh, just to gain prestige or power in a religious culture. So, for example, say in, in India, we have a, one of our most prominent Krishna temples is in, is in Juhu, which is very close to where Bollywood is and many Bollywood stars stay over there. Now, sometimes these Bollywood stars also visit the temple and some of them may have genuine some, some genuine sentiment or devotion but some of them might just come there as a photo op they come there and you know india is still a religious country and you say on janmashtami or some sacred days if someone goes to a temple and then they say that oh i, I went to on janmashtami to a temple then the followers may say oh you're such a nice person you you are such a successful star but you also are religious you also have some devotional side, cultural devotional side to you. Now, if that is their motive in doing that, then, then what is it? They are not going to the temple to take darshan. They are going to temple to give darshan. Not to see the Lord, but to be seen by people. So the rituals are meant to be primarily a reciprocation between us and the divine. But if the divine is completely neglected or just utilized for just creating an image in the world, then those rituals do not not only do they serve do not serve the right purpose, they conceal the wrong purpose that we have. So some people we might see they they are very humble in front of their seniors, but they are very harsh in front of their juniors. Then their humility doesn't come from a developed humanity or spirituality, which is how it should be. And somebody is an evolved human being, somebody is an evolved spiritual person, and they are humble. 
but if somebody acts humble in front of their seniors and very harsh and judgmental before their juniors then what is happening for them their humility might not be an expression of their spirituality their humility might just be a password to power in a structure that gives them power over others so by acting humble in front of my superiors i gain power and then i can dominate my the people lo- below me so religious rituals get a bad name when they are done not just uh, as a formality but then uh, but they are abused as a cynical tool for impressing or controlling others but that abuse of a thing does not make that thing bad it just means that the abuse is bad rituals are universal and rituals are essential uh, for the ordering of our daily lives now moving forward so this is with, let's come back to the point of again sacrificial rituals now yagya what does it actually mean the word yagya is as i said especially when it is used as a fire sacrifice it to the to the ultra rational mind might seem difficult to comprehend what exactly is going on we take some we take some objects and just put them into fire and they get burned to ashes so isn't it just a waste well not no no there is the principle of exchange and there is the medium of exchange so what is the principle over here that fire represents the cosmos the universe which has provided us the various necessities for living we may work hard to get our daily bread to put food on our table but even all our hard work won't put any food on our table if nature itself doesn't provide it so our endeavors are essential for getting our needs fulfilled but our endeavors are secondary nature's provision is primary so it is said that the birds birds need to search to get their nuts and seeds and whatever they eat but the bird searching doesn't produce those nuts and seeds it is god who provides so our efforts are much more sophisticated than the birds searching around here and there but in principle they are just that we are searching but unless something is already provided for we can't get it so so when we are doing sacrifice what are we doing we are acknowledging to the universe and ultimately to the divine who is in charge of the universe that we are grateful for what has been given to us so it's a exchange devan bhavayata mena te deva bhavayantu vah parasparam bhavayanta shreya paramavapsyata so devan bhavayata mena that we That, that that we satisfy the divine beings and the divine beings satisfy us by providing our needs just like a cultured uh a, in a, say parents who want to teach some culture to their children might tell them that you no know, if somebody gives you some gift you should thank them so if somebody gives them a, ch- a, ch- a child a chocolate or ice cream or uh, something like that then thank you so then what are we doing you get something you offer our gratitude express our gratitude so just that that's one way of expressing culture similarly here the idea of sacrifice is we express our gratitude to the higher realities that provide for our necessities in the world so the fire becomes the medium through which whatever we are offering is conveyed to the divine and we don't have to bother too much about the we don't have to get worked up about the specifics say based on different cultures the specific medium of exchange can vary widely if somebody who is a, who is a tribal living completely unconnected disconnected from modern technology if they come to a city and they go to a bank and they see somebody coming with a big pile of notes and then this person gives this pile of notes to the bank and in return just get one card hey you are being cheated you wasted all that big money all that much money and all that you got was one card but that card is not just a card 
there is a whole sophisticated system of economic exchange by which that card becomes equivalent uh, to the amount of money that we have given to the bank. So the specifics of the medium of exchange need to be understood through the appropriate education. Just as some basic economic education will help the person to the tribal person to appreciate digital 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 currency or other forms of currency. Sometimes we might not even have a card. We might just have some numbers. And just those numbers, knowing those numbers and entering those numbers somewhere can just give us access to money. So just as sophisticated systems of exchange need to be understood before they can be, otherwise they can seem just odd. Similarly, the idea is fire sacrifices are means by which our offerings are made to the divine, are conveyed to the divine. Now moving forward, so, so this, this fire sacrifice is just one example. But again, what is the example? This is a ritual, but the ritual conveys something. And that is, it's, a, it's not just a psychological conveying of things, but it's also a, a sophisticated medium by which certain exchange happens. Now, beyond the, beyond the specifics of such sacrifices, where we thank uh, the divine for what we have been provided, the Bhagavad Gita says that, Make all of your work into a sacrifice. All of life is meant to be a sacrifice. So in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Yajna karma samudbhavaha. Yajna comes from karma. So our work needs to be done in such a way that the work becomes a sacrifice. Now what does it mean? Everything we do is for a higher purpose instead of for our immediate pleasure. Earlier, I talked about the concept of Karma, Daiva and Kala leading to Fala in 247. So now when we do our Karma, normally our purpose is to get the Fala. When we do our work, we expect the result. The, the, the complete chain is our work plus our destiny plus the time duration. The duty plus destiny plus time duration leads to the desired result. So when we are to work as sacrifice, what that means is that we don't work for gaining the result primarily. We work for pleasing the Lord. For uh, that I have been given certain abilities. I have been certain situations. Let me do whatever I am meant to do in a mood of sacrifice and service. And then uh, we, offer the, we offer our work itself in a mood of service. And if you get the fruits, the fruits also we offer as a sacrifice. That sacrifice might be by giving charity. Uh, that might be by using the, the work for using the fruits of the work for sacred purposes. But the idea is both the work can be done in the mood of sacrifice, and the fruits of the work are also meant to be sacrificed. So there is a mood of sacrifice, and there is also the uh, also the actual sacrificing of something tangible, which is to be done. Both are there. So here, we offer the fruits to the divine with detachment and devotion. Uh, detachment, yes, this is not mine. This was actually meant for the Lord. And that becomes a means by which we express our devotion to the Lord. And this is the principle of karma yoga. We will talk about various principles, various parts of yoga in a later class. But explain in this terms, what happens in karma yoga is that the Lord, Krishna, he takes the karma and gives us the yoga. Yoga means connection that our work can bring us closer to the Lord. That is the connection with the Lord. So our karma can lead to yoga. So here I talk about karma, daiva, kala leads to phala. So if we don't obsess with the phala, we obsess over the phala, we focus on doing the karma in the mood of seva, in the mood of yajna. Then such yajna, such work done in the form of a sacrifice elevates our consciousness, connects us with the divine, increases our devotion. And so the Lord becomes pleased when we do work in a mood of sacrifice. And then the karma goes to the, 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 we, the karma here refers to, he takes the karma means there is no bondage resulting from karma. There is no, mm, there is no, we don't become karmically impl karmically implicated, but rather we become elevated and liberated. 
So briefly, what do what does it mean? Krishna takes the karma. The concept of karma itself is complicated, and I'll discuss it later again. But at this point, the word karma can mean two things. It can refer to the actions that we are doing. It can also refer to the reactions we are getting. Oh, I'm suffering my own karma. Here, when we use that word, I am suffering my own karma. That means we are suffering the results of our karma. So when Krishna takes the karma, that means he takes away the reactions of our karma. We don't become bound by those actions. <clears throat> so what what is bondage? At one level, it's psychological. Another level, it's cosmological. Psychological means that every action that we do, it creates an impression within our consciousness. And then that impression impels us to repeat that action. So if uh, suppose somebody who is never drunk alcohol, but if they drink liquor once, they, uh, they might just take a wine or a beer or a, something on a celebratory occasion. And they take it once, but then that creates an impression. And that impression impels them to take it again and again and again. And these, impulse, these impressions become stronger and stronger. And that's how they become bound. Now, the impressions are formed because that attachment uh, is being because they are trying to enjoy that activity and that enjoyment creates a uh, further fixation with that activity. But when somebody is working, so some so, so, so now the alcoholism is just one example, but when we work for doing any results, say we work at our job to earn a salary. Now, if our whole focus is on the salary, when will I get it? When will I get it? When will I get it? then naturally that emotional entanglement happens with it. But if we are working in the idea that, yes, whatever I am, my whole life is meant for the service of the Lord. The, my work I'm doing in the mood of service and the results that I get, that with those also I'll use in, in the service of the Lord. Then service of the Lord can include, include taking care of my family members, service of the Lord can include various aspects of my life. Of course, service of the Lord also includes direct devotional activities which we do. But if we have that attitude, it's not that we don't care for the results, but we are not obsessed with the results. And if there is no obsession with the result, then the impressions are not created that much deep. And that's how we can avoid getting entangled. We can avoid getting bound. So that's that's what Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita in this verse. Yajnarthat karmano anyatra loko ayam karma bandhana. O Garjuna, Work in the spirit of sacrifice. Otherwise, your work will bind you. But if you work in the mood of sacrifice, then you will not become bound, but you will become liberated. You will become more and more attached to the object of sacrifice, to the divine. And that attachment to the divine will open the doors to liberation for you. So I'll summarize and then we can have a few questions. I spoke, I spoke on the topic of <clears throat> what, uh, what is sacrifice today? Is it a ritual? Are rituals necessary? So sacrifice uh, based on 3.9 three in the Bhagavad Gita. So sacrifice in one sense is essential because it's, it's the idea of giving up something immediate for something long term. And <clears throat> this is what is done in various walks of life in daily life, in sports. In fact, if you want to achieve anything substantial in life, often you have to sacrifice. Give up something immediate for something long term. And sacrifice also has intrinsically a spiritual or religious context to it. Where it's to, it comes from to make sacred, to sacralize, to, to make something sacred. So then I talk about the specific forms in which sacrifices can be performed. That, that those are rituals. So fire sacrifice is a ritual. And I discussed about how rituals are there in all walks of life. The examples of uh, shaking hands, of blowing candles, of conveying a uh, sixer in cricket. So rituals provide, rituals are basically structures for conveying our emotions and organizing our actions. Now, in the religious context, rituals serve multiple purposes. They make our consciousness receptive for the experience of the divine. They express our devotion for the divine when it is present. 
they induce the devotion or they express our desire for the devotion when it is not present however as if a ritual is meant to connect us with the divine when there is no desire to connect uh, then or there is no emotion that connects then the ritual becomes just an empty shell it becomes a formality and if the ritual is done with no regard for the divine but just with regard for the world then the ritual can become a simply a tool for gaining prestige and power in a religious society in a religious culture and uh, these rituals so they can have different specific forms and i talked about the fire sacrifice as a ritual where what where what the universe provides us ultimately we return to the universe through the medium of the fire which is a manifestation of a divine being who acts as a medium so the mediums of exchange can vary based on culture just as <clears throat> we can give a lot of money and just get one credit card and that might seem like a like a deceptive exchange or a lo- losing exchange for somebody who doesn't know about about the sophisticated economic systems that govern modern societies uh, similarly there is a system of exchange between us and the the divine beings overseeing the universe when we offer them our gratitude through the fire sacrifices and then it is not just specific religious rituals but sacrifices meant to underlie and unify all aspects of our life we work in a mood of sacrifice and we offer the fruits of our work in that way work becomes a sacrifice and when it is done this way then krishna when we perform karma yoga the idea is we will all do karma but when we do it is a mood of with devotion and attachment then krishna takes the karma and gives us the yoga we get the connection so if we are obsessed with the results then the impressions formed within us impel us to repeat that action again and again uh, and that's how we become bound to that action uh, but if our intention is primarily to serve the lord then the impressions that are formed within us are those which connect us with the lord so even if we do the external action the impressions don't just impel us to repeat that action the impressions uh, form impel us to connect with the lord and thus we become not bound but become elevated and liberated thank you hare krishna so there are a few questions here how can somebody working in a company work to please the lord why why can't we work that way so the idea is god is not rest- god's presence is not restricted to a temple god's jurisdiction extends over the whole world and if we act if we think that our talents are gifts given to us by the lord then we use them wherever is the arena for using them or the bhagavad gita demonstrates how even a war can be fought in the mood of service to the lord vishwanath chakravarti thakur a prominent gita commentator used the example that suppose there's a family in which the breadwinner is living far away their job takes them far away from their home and they may be in a different city they may be Uh, interacting with very different people but maybe in their wallet they have a picture of their family members and although they are working and interacting with many different people in their heart they know i am doing all this for my family so externally they are there in all those activities and they are doing those activities well competently so that they can earn a living uh, earn good money and then they want to give it to their family so when there is when there is uh, attachment when there is emotional engagement then even if there is someone if someone is not physically close to anyone else still there can be inner remembrance and there can be the inner connection so we were so similarly we are in the world and in the world in some ways we don't see the lord close by we can't perceive his presence as clearly as we perceive it in the temples or in some directly spiritual places but that doesn't mean that he is not present and ultimately 
everything that is the best in the world is meant for the Lord. The Lord is a supreme living being and devotion means that we want to offer the best to the Lord. So if the say the best professionals in a particular field are devotees then that itself is an offering to the Lord. And if those best professionals say if somebody is a very bright student often when I speak in college universities in India sometimes students ask now how can I share share spiritual wisdom with my other co-students? I say one of the one of the ways is by studying diligently. Huh. If you study well, that it, there's no guarantee just by that your friends will become spiritually inclined. But if you study poorly, there's a, almost a guarantee that your students will that your co-students will become spiritually unreceptive or spiritually antipathetic yes. because the actions speak louder than words. So Arjuna became the greatest archer because he wanted to serve Krishna through his archery. And so we try to do our work as well as we can. Now, now it's ultra competitive world. And if we think I have to become the top in that, then that might consume us so much that we might say, I have no time for my spiritual life. No, that won't work. Because just like if the person who is a fa- who is, who is a fa- who is the breadwinner goes away from the family, and stays away from the family for years, saying that I'm doing this all this for the family. But uh, what is out of them, what is uh, out of sight often goes out of the mind. It goes out of the heart. So there needs to be periodic connection so that that uh, periodic contact, so that that connection stays real. Similarly, we need to, we need to have regular time for Connect for nourishing ourselves spiritually, for associating with spiritually minded people, going to externals where also the spiritual is manifested. But after we do that on a regular basis, uh, then during the time when we are in the world, we work wholeheartedly and gradually, initially, when we work, the externals are what consume our consciousness. It's like, say, first time when I gave a, a sp- I spoke about the Bhagavad Gita about 20, more than 20 years ago. Uh, 20, 22, 23 years ago. So at that time, uh, I was so conscious. Oh, you know, how am I speaking? Are, how are people are re- receptive to me? I, are people hearing attentively? I was so conscious. Okay, where am I? I'm in this particular room, this setting. But over the years, as I, as I keep doing that, now of course, I'm conscious of those things. So if something I can do to make the message more intelligible or more accessible, I do that. But more important than where I am speaking is what I am speaking. So when we keep initially the externals dominate our consciousness, but gradually the externals, they remain in our awareness, but they go into the background and the internals, why we are doing it, our intention that comes in the foreground. So initially, of course, when we are doing something new, it will take time for us to recognize that I'm doing to assimilate that we are doing it for Krishna. But if Krishna becomes the driving purpose of our life, and over a period of time, uh, the externals of where we are working won't matter as much as the intention with which we are working. So broadly, three things. One is we understand that God is present everywhere. And whatever we do, because it's God, God's ability is gifted to us, we are trying to use in his service. So God can be accessed everywhere. Second is, if internally in our hearts we are connected with the Lord, then that connection will be there in our hearts, no matter what actions we are doing. So we need a regular time to establish and reinforce, strengthen that connection. And thirdly, if you keep doing something, gradually the foreground, the gradually the externals go into the background and our purpose stays in the foreground of our consciousness. That's how we can work for the Lord's pleasure. So there are some rituals that we do simply to satisfy our beliefs. Should we do such uh, rituals or should we not? Because such rituals are primarily, say for example, we might offer some shraddha to our ancestors. Now this is a very specific example. Uh, The focus should be primarily on understanding the principle behind what we are doing. And depending on time, place, circumstances, certain, certain rituals become important, certain rituals don't become important. So for example, 
in a particular country, if we are in a particular country, we are citizens of that country, the national anthem is played or the flag has been unfurled, then we may have to stand in attention or salute or whatever is appropriate at that time. Now, if we are in a different country and <clears throat> at that place, there's a different flag than if we are migrated to that country, for a citizen of that country, then the principle remains the same, but the way we, but the specifics vary. So we need to, when we are doing any rituals, to have the spirit. It's not just a matter of emotion. It's also a matter of reason. So if we are going to do some rituals, then we need to rationally analyze and understand so that we, we ourselves at least have some intellectual, uh, intellectual grounding for whatever we are doing. And secondly, we also need to push, our, we also need to infuse emotion. So <clears throat> if now whether to do a particular ritual or not, that's an entirely different subject. And I won't go into that here. But if we are going to do some ritual, then it's better to have both the reason and the emotion involved in it. And there are whatever appropriate resources are there for that. That means we read some literature which, which satisfies our reasons, reasoning fact, which are intelligence, nourishes our intelligence. And then we, we create the appropriate atmosphere or associate with those who have that emotion. And then we can also develop that emotion. Then we will feel the connection uh, that is that is the purpose of that emotion, purpose of that ritual rather. So even if we do not, this is a question from Meera. Even if we do not have the mood of service just by performing the rituals, namely performing Abhishek to the Lord, chanting 16 rounds, Krishna sees our effort and gives us the right mood. If but if we keep practice for long and still we don't get the taste, then how do we keep up the motivation to continue? Yeah, it is, there are certain things which become important or major rituals in our life. And when that happens, at those times, we need to regularly reinforce our conviction and rejuvenate our emotion. So for example, with respect to our chanting if you are doing that now that takes a significant amount of time on a daily basis and it's easy we might get it's easy to for it to become mechanical on some days in some ways we might get some some spiritual experiences we might feel very very strongly the presence of the divine we might feel ourselves strengthened by the mantra chant but other days we may not so over a period of time we need to observe what are the sources of strength for us? What is it that strengthens my conviction? What is it that strengthens my devotional emotion? And then we need to regularly expose ourselves to them. It is only by such regular exposure that we will have the impetus to continue. And it's a long spiritual journey. And on this journey, we sometimes get our experiences. Sometimes we don't get those experiences. So either way, uh, just because we don't have the devotional ex divine experience or we don't feel the divine presence or we don't feel anything, any connection, that doesn't mean we have to give up the ritual. It just means that we need to find out what will nourish us. So even among the various rituals that we do, uh, based we might observe that some rituals we connect with very easily. Some rituals we actually feel joy in doing those things. And some rituals we have to push ourselves to do those things. So Somebody might just love singing. Somebody might just love philosophy and hearing classes. But somebody, that same person might have to sit and uh, chant mantras. They might find it difficult. Then we need to, we need to balance ourselves. There are some rituals which may require strength for us to do. And there will be some rituals that, that are so joyful for us that we get strength by doing those things. Then we need to make sure that we do enough the things that give us strength so that we have enough strength to do the things that require strength from us. That's how we can continue. How does work create bondage? Is it the fruit of the work or the intent with which we perform work? In both ways, it's not a digital logic one or zero. It's analog. The idea is bondage essentially means our consciousness is bound. It's not physical ropes that bind us when you talk about bondage in the world. 
it is the, the soul and the body are different but what binds the soul to the body is the soul's desire to enjoy the worldly objects that can be enjoyed through the body purushah prakriti sthohi bhungte prakriti jan gunan karanam guna sangosya sadasad yoni janmasu that the soul this is 1322 in the bhagavad gita this is the soul becomes bound because of the desire bhungte prakriti jan gunan bhungte because of desire to enjoy so basically what causes what causes the essence of bondage is the soul's desire to enjoy uh, the objects of the world through the body so, so when we are doing the work what is it that causes bondage more for most most people it is not that they just love the work for pe- most people work is something that they do so that they can get the results and the results may be maybe prestige maybe money and then they can enjoy the money so then it is what we are what we are desiring to enjoy that is what causes bondage so if somebody loves a work very much then that itself can also cause a bondage so it could be the intent of the work it could be the content of the work it could be the result the consequence of the work any of these can cause bondage so if if somebody says somebody very strongly craves for something then even if they don't get it still they might be bound in it just like say in india some students just get infatuated with wanting to get a iit seat a seat in one of the premier colleges in india in institute of technology and they may try one year they may try a second year they may try a third year they may try three four five years and even if they don't get it they finally move on to some other college but they are constantly regretting oh or lamenting why didn't i get that why did i get that then they're they're still emotionally caught in that so the intent itself can entangle sometimes even if there is even if they are no longer studying for iit they no longer in iit but still they are entangled uh, sometimes the work itself we become so obsessed with the work that we forget why we are doing the work then the work can bind the in the 10th canto of the shrimad bhagavatam there is a story of the yagyik brahmanas those who were performing sac- uh, sac- brahmanical fire sacrifices and they got so caught in the in the nitty gritties of the sacrifice and they just get such joy in this doing that oh this should be done like this, this should be done like this don't do like this there is a certain joy in uh, just making things precisely and feeling oh just see how expert i am in this but that krishna himself came and they forgot about krishna they neglected krishna because they just so got so caught in the activity that they forgot the purpose of the activity so sometimes the work itself can entangle and sometimes of course the results of the work that is the money that we want the prestige that we want that can entangle so we have to see specifically what is it that is consuming our consciousness and the essence of attachment is the consumption of the consciousness then um, there are two more questions so okay so what is one supposed to what exactly is one supposed to do to make the work into sacrifice yes so say one one does one's work well one succeeds professionally but eventually what after that okay two things here first point is that whenever we work it's important for us to uh recognize that it's a matter of consciousness so if one keeps working but one is also spending the adequate amount of time practicing bhakti and growing toward krishna uh, and growing in our devotion then more and more the object of the work will become the focus of our consciousness and then that's how the work will become more and more a form of worship so it's not that we have to physically do any rituals that will signify the attitude of worship it's more the emotion the more the the consciousness of which we are doing it so, so arjuna as i said the example of a topmost archer he was doing his archery and along with that he was doing his devotional act, along with uh, so but he was doing it in the mood of service to krishna so as we grow spiritually broadly three things will happen one is while doing a particular activity we won't get so caught up in that activity itself in the successes and failures ups and downs will stay more stable because we are doing it not just to avoid the failure or to gain a success we are doing it to please the lord so we'll become more stable while we are doing that activity and then secondly as we advance spiritually 
we will want also to connect more and more with Krishna. So the times when we can do that, uh, times when we can read spiritual literature, go in the association of devotees, go to sacred places, uh, those those are the things we will really look forward to. Because if we are eager, if we are getting attached to Krishna, then we pursue Krishna when he is not directly manifested. But we also relish Krishna's presence whenever he, he wherever and whenever he's directly manifested. And we long for that. That's the second thing. And the third thing is that when we keep practicing bhakti religion, when we are working in the mood of worship, then we try to find more and more avenues by which we can spiritualize whatever we are doing. That means in an appropriate way, we may try to share our spirituality with others. In an appropriate way, we may re- we use the fruits of our spirituality for uh, for offering to others. We may, if our if we have acquired a particular position through our, uh, our profession, then we may use the position to to attract people toward Krishna. So, if a person is a is a very successful, and then they say that you know it's it's my bhakti that may, it's my bhakti that makes me tick. Then people, oh really? Yadya Dacharati Sreshtas Tatta Devi Tarojana. So as great people do, ordinary people want to do the same thing. So that way we can attract other people to Krishna also. So all this will happen more as we connect with Krishna. Now, there is one elaborate question, one question which will require elaborate answer about why does Krishna refer to himself in the third person? And I will answer this elaborately later, but suffice it to say that uh, at this point that Krishna Krishna has not yet in the Gita revealed himself as God. It is when he reveals himself as the divine that he will say that I am the object of the divine. I had answered this question elaborately in a previous class. Uh, you may, uh, we will make the, so the, I won't repeat that answer for those who are present. But essentially, Krishna is not revealing himself as the divine right now. He's just revealing him, specifying himself as the teacher of spiritual knowledge. As the Gita progresses further, within the thought flow of the Gita, Krishna will reveal his position and then he will talk directly about himself in the first person. So based on the kind of message that he is giving and the frame of reference, the context within that he is giving, sometimes he refers to the divine in the first person and sometimes in the third person. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.